Shakespeare has created what we might call a didactic text. In other words, a text with a moral or cautionary message for its audience. In the case of Macbeth, Shakespeare is using the form of dramatic tragedy, a fancy way of saying a play where everyone dies, to show the inevitable downfall of those who sacrifice their morals in the climb to power. If even Macbeth, who is first introduced as a noble and loyal hero, can warp into a delusional, evil tyrant, then Shakespeare's clearly sending a strong warning that ambition can corrupt the best of us. While that's all probably obvious so far, let's go through the text and pick out some examples of how Shakespeare actually communicates this message to the audience. You'll probably remember Macbeth's encounter with the witches in Act 1, Scene 3. Up until that point, Macbeth seemed to be pretty content as a loyal servant of King Duncan. The fact that Shakespeare showers Macbeth with epithets, which are like binames or descriptors, like brave or noble Macbeth, emphasises his obedience to the king, and when the witches foretell that he'll replace Duncan, he's genuinely shocked. To be king stands not within the prospect of belief, he says. In other words, doubting the possibility that he'll become ruler and suggesting that the thought of gaining more power had never crossed his mind. But in this scene, Banquo introduces a metaphor, the seeds of time, that foreshadows how the seed of ambition the witches have planted in Macbeth's mind will grow into something monstrous. But although Macbeth admits to the audience through an aside, where a character tells the audience what they are thinking, that the prophecy has inspired the rapture of which Banquo speaks, metaphorically calling the witch's news a happy prologue, he also realises that to become king, he will probably have to kill Duncan. He is horrified, saying, The horrid image doth unfix my hair. This means the very idea of killing Duncan makes his hair stand on end in fear. He hopes in an aside that chance, which Shakespeare personifies, will crown him king without his stir, i.e. without him having to do anything himself. But since the audience is familiar with the conventions of dramatic tragedy, we know that this isn't going to be a happy prologue, to a happy play like Macbeth hopes. Banquo insightfully notes that the instruments of darkness, a metaphor for the witches and other supernatural forces, betray men into deepest consequence, basically death. Thus, the very first act establishes the inevitable, tragic end of Macbeth's ambitious climb to power. Later. In the fourth scene of Act One, Macbeth greets King Duncan, who showers him with praise after his victory in battle. But Shakespeare deliberately structures Act One to introduce dramatic tension or suspense in the play. All the epithets that Duncan had used to Lord Macbeth in Scene Two, noble Macbeth, worthy Macbeth, brave Macbeth, seem a bit hollow in Scene Four now that we know that this once loyal soldier is starting to eye the throne for himself. This is also the point at which Shakespeare begins to develop asides as a dominant dramatic technique in the play, using them to reveal the internal conflict between Macbeth's social duties and sense of loyalty and his newfound ambition for power. The asides give the audience a private insight into the dichotomy, which is a good word to describe a strong contrast or divide, between the loyal exterior Macbeth presents to his countrymen and the scheming, power-hungry interior that is unleashed by the witch's prophecy. A good example of this dichotomy is when Macbeth, right after being praised by the naive Duncan as worthy Cawdor, turns in an aside to the audience and says, The Prince of Cumberland, that is a step on which I must fall down or else o'erleap, for in my way it lies. 
He basically means here that Duncan's son, the Prince of Cumberland and rightful heir, must be somehow got rid of in a do-or-die mission because he's in the way of Macbeth's climb to the throne. That's a stark reversal from the facade Macbeth presents to Duncan, showing just how quickly ambition has corrupted his sense of honour and loyalty. Macbeth even goes on to say in the same aside, Stars, hide your fires. Let not light see my black and deep desires. The contrast of imagery between the stars, symbols of the heavens and purity, and the darkness of Macbeth's evil desires emphasises the moral corruption that Macbeth's ambition has caused. But while Macbeth alludes here to his increasing willingness to commit the very crime that once unfixed his hair, Lady Macbeth, upon hearing about the witch's prophecy, doubts Macbeth's capacity to go through with it. I fear thy nature, she says of Macbeth, ironically not because she is scared of his black and deep desires, but because she fears he doesn't have the guts to make them a reality. I fear thy nature. It is too full of the milk of human kindness, she says of her husband, using the symbol of breast milk to subtly question Macbeth's manliness. In an interesting inversion of Elizabethan gender stereotypes, it's Lady Macbeth who gains the courage to do what's necessary, no matter how violent, to put her husband on the throne. It seems that the witch's prophecy spurs her ambition more so than Macbeth's. Praying from her castle rooftop to demons, which would have been a horrifying image to Shakespeare's deeply Christian audience, she offers to sacrifice her humanity so that her ambition can be fulfilled. Fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty, she pleads, going on to pray that the heavens don't witness Duncan's murder. Lady Macbeth knows that her plan is deeply immoral. In fact, she fears that guilt will come back to haunt her, which is why she begs these spirits to make thick her blood. A metaphor for blocking out any feeling of remorse. But since we know that a dramatic tragedy is hardly going to end well, we get a sneaking suspicion that Macbeth and his wife won't be able to escape the guilt of their crime. Macbeth is spurred to action by his eager wife, but he too contemplates in soliloquy the impact murder will have. A soliloquy is when a character shares their innermost thoughts with the audience. In a rare moment of insight, he fears that this bloody deed will plague the inventor, suggesting through metaphor that the moral repercussions of his murderous ambition will haunt him like a disease. He personifies or gives human qualities to justice, saying that Even-handed justice commends the ingredients of our poisoned chalice to our own lips. In other words, justice will make sure that such a heinous crime, metaphorically described as the poisoned chalice, will come back to bite him. He fears that if he kills Duncan, he will die the same way. Macbeth's inner fears foreshadow their realisation at the end of the play. But despite the self-harm he rightly worries awaits him, he succumbs to his ambition. It's all-consuming. He uses a metaphor to liken his journey to power to being on a horse he can't control. I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, only vaulting ambition which o'erleaps itself. In other words, he has no motive to keep charging forward except ambition for its own sake which seems to unstoppably hurtle him towards self-destruction. The gloomy tone of his words conveys his helplessness, but the audience is forced to wonder whether Macbeth can justify his actions as a loss of control. The hallucination of a dagger that guides him to Duncan's chambers similarly becomes an externalisation of his fear and guilt. Even the witches might just be a figment of Macbeth's imagination, 
a reflection of the dormant evil inside of him. It's as if Macbeth can't face the reality of his black and deep desires, so he convinces himself that it's external, often supernatural forces, like witches and ghostly visions, that are leading him to sin. But that self-delusion can't last long. After Duncan's murder, both Macbeth and his wife descend into madness as the repercussions of their ambition catch up with them. At the beginning of the play, the characters spoke in a well-formed iambic pentameter, where each line has ten syllables and every second syllable is emphasised. This type of verse conveys order and stability, but here Macbeth is speaking in free verse, which has no clearly ordered rhyme or rhythm to capture his mental chaos. Macbeth and his wife realise the heinousness of their ambition all too late. And blood becomes the dominant motif, a motif being a recurring symbol or image to convey their guilt. Although Lady Macbeth claims that a little water clears us of this deed, appealing to the symbolism of holy water to try to absolve them of the crime, Macbeth is not so sure. After killing Duncan, he laments in a rhetorical question, Will all great Neptune's oceans wash this blood clean from my hand? Here Shakespeare uses superlative imagery, which means overblown or exaggerated imagery, to convey the magnitude of Macbeth's crime. All the water in the world couldn't wash away Duncan's blood. Even Lady Macbeth herself later becomes convinced that her hands are stained with blood, saying, Out, damned spot! Out, I say! The repetition and the frantic tone created by the exclamation marks all work together to express Lady Macbeth's guilt-ridden madness. Ultimately, Shakespeare paints a damning portrait of the consequences of ambition warning his audience against sacrificing their morality for their own selfish purposes. It never ends well. We hope you enjoyed this Schooling Online production. For more easy lessons on Macbeth, check out our analysis of the theme of power in the play.